Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Great, great, great. I think we're ready, Earl. May I start? Yes? Great, thank you. So it's really good to see so many of you out this morning for our executive leadership breakfast. I want to bring you greetings from our over 8,000 students, our almost 200 full-time faculty, our over 200 adjunct faculty, our many staff. I want to say to you that we appreciate your presence here and we appreciate all the support you've given to York in the past, that you give to York today, and that you will continue to give to York in the future. So some of you know that about eight years ago, these executive leadership breakfasts started. And it was an idea that someone really pitched to us at York because they thought that York could do for Queens and Jamaica what certain other uh, groups like Cranes uh, do for Manhattan. To bring in opinion makers to talk about issues of the day. And so over the years, starting in the fall of 2005, we started conversations with opinion makers on issues of the day. We've had, for instance, Congressman Meeks in the aftermath of Katrina. We have had Christine Quinn when she uh, took office as Speaker of the House. We have had Bill Thompson when he was the Comptroller, and I remember that morning, it was a very rainy morning. Most of us had to get into the ark to get here. We don't have that this morning. We've had David Nealman of JetBlue, Kevin Burke of Con Edison, and others. This morning, we have someone from our own home, Queens, Julius Wool. It's not my role to introduce him, but I do want to thank you so much for joining us this morning to give us that executive leadership breakfast talk on an issue, certainly, of the day. But I want to take a little bit of time to really bring greetings and to acknowledge some people in the room. I want to thank uh, members of my advisory board who've been th there for York for so many years. I want to thank members of our foundation board. I want to thank our alumni. They're always there supporting us. I want to really also give a little bit of a promo uh, that next, next Monday we have our gala, Eddie Palmieri. It is a worthy event, raising funds for merit scholars here at York. So if you haven't bought your ticket yet, I know there are still a few tickets available. You can check with the box office. And it is towards the worthy cause of merit scholarships for our York students. And of course, today, I've acknowledged a few people from the outside. I want to acknowledge our York students. York students are who are in the house. From various areas, we have the health sciences represented, we have business represented, I know we have the liberal arts, I know there's a journalism student in the house because they follow the news and they report it well. So, we at York are very proud about the work we do on the academic side, and we're also very proud about our relationships. And the work we do could not be done if we did not have a very dedicated, very well-equipped, very forward-looking faculty. And so I just want to acknowledge our faculty, all of them, but those who are here today, and to say how pleased we are as an administration to work with you in partnership to develop the very, very best for our students. So with the York faculty who are in the house, please stand so we can all acknowledge you.
thank you so much. My last set of acknowledgments before I bring up uh, the person who will introduce our guest speaker, and that is to some of our elected officials who are either here or represented. I want to acknowledge Manny Kaufman from uh, Assembly Scarborough's office. I want to acknowledge, yes, thank you so much, Manny, for always being there. I think you must have been at the first, and uh, you'll always represent uh, Assemblyman Scarborough so well. And of course, Assemblyman Scarborough does such good work with us uh, in partnering not only with issues related to the middle school, but issues of environment, of economic development, and so on. And naturally, I've got to give a little shout out to uh, our former councilman, uh, Archie Spinger. Well, you don't put former in front of his name, actually. <laughs> you, you really, really don't. Um, Archie Spinger, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for being here. So it's become a little bit of a tradition in recent, uh, recent times. Um, in the past, I usually introduce the guest speaker. But over the last three or four breakfasts, we've decided to put our students um, to work, as it were. And this morning, I am very, very pleased that Mr. Idan Brown, a student in our nursing program, he's a, did you say lower or upper junior? An upper junior uh, in our generic nursing program will join me now to introduce our keynote speaker. Mr. Brown, please come forward. Good morning. And welcome to the York College Executive Leadership Breakfast. I am Edan Brown, an upper junior majoring in the generic nursing program here at York. And I am pleased to have been chosen to introduce this morning's speaker, Mr. Julius Wool. An excellent choice to address this gathering given our numerous health programs here at York. In addition to nursing, York also offers majors in the health field, in the allied health field, sorry, such as physician, physician's assistant studies, clinical laboratory science, pharmaceutical science, community health, gerontological studies and services, and a BSMS in occupational health, in occupational therapy, I'm sorry, the only one of its kind in all of CUNY. Mr. Wool, I also would like to thank you on behalf of my fellow students for the internship opportunities offered by Queens Hospital Center, as well as any employment opportunities that may be available <laughs> <laughs> to your graduates. Mr. Wool has been an executive director of Queens Hospital Center since December 2010. Prior to that, he served as the chief financial officer for the Queens Health Network, which is comprised of both the Queens and Elmhurst Hospital Centers since 1998. And Mr. Wool has also served as the budget director Chief Information Officer and Deputy CFO at Queens Hospital Center. He also was responsible for the Network Manage Care Department and Health Management Department at Elmhurst Hospital Center. Excuse me. He has been a major contributor to network strategic planning and has recently led several network breakthrough initiatives, including the inpatient documentation and coding improvement project. I think one of the reasons Mr. Wool has been so successful in his career is his ability to relate to people. This self-described true son of Queens grew up in the Pomenoc houses in Flushing and graduated from the Benjamin Cardozo High School in Bayside. He earned his college degrees at two of York's sister CUNY colleges, first with an undergraduate degree in political sciences from Queens College and his master's degree in public administration from Baruch College. Yeah, CUNY. <laughs> you can read 
the rest of his impressive resume in your program. But for now, please join me in welcoming to the podium our speaker for the morning, Mr. Julius Wool. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown and, and President Kites. Uh, and I'll welcome all of you, again, faculty, students. Um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to present here today and, and discuss, um, from my perspective, what the um, Affordable Care Act is all about and what it means for us in, in healthcare in this country. I, I'd also like to acknowledge I'm able to do this presentation and actually have some time to think about the Affordable Care Act because I have my senior executive, some of my senior executive staff here from Queens Hospital Center who actually run Queens Hospital Center. So I get a few minutes to read about the Affordable Care Act. So again, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the executive staff from Queens Hospital Center. So, um, I will begin by giving us a little background in terms of the Affordable Care Act and the national health care reform. And I'm going to start by talking about why. Why is it necessary? Why did this come about? And the single biggest driving force behind the need for major change in our health care system in this country is, can be seen on this graph. So you can see that right now, about 17% of the entire economy is spent on health care. And by 2020, if that trend continues, 20% of our entire economy would be spent on health care. And then again, based on current trends in, this, in the health care system, you can see that by 2072, we're going to 30, 35%. So again, we have a completely unsustainable path in terms of health care costs. And this, this health care reform has multiple goals, and I'm going to talk about those goals. And they include quality, improving quality and safety, access. But we all have to understand that what is driving this is this slide. It's this unsustainable cost in the growth of health care in this country. And, and why is that a problem? Dr. Kites and I were just talking about some of the financial challenges that CUNY has. Well, if the healthcare sector is taking one out of every five dollars of the economy, or ultimately one out of every three dollars, if we don't fix it, then all the other sectors of the economy, education included, will have less resources. So again, we can't have a balanced economy, we can't have a balance um, in our society if healthcare is just growing at an unsustainable rate. What's driving this? Why is it growing at this rate? Anybody have any ideas? Why is healthcare growing at this rate? Way, way faster than any other sector of the economy. Baby boomers, aging of the population is the single biggest factor. Baby boomers aging. The other major factor is technology. In healthcare, it's a race to get the newest, latest, greatest technology. Technology is expensive. That's what's driving this tremendous growth. Okay, so in this slide, you can see, so not only is it growing, the, the portion of the economy dedicated to healthcare is growing, but this slide shows how we compare to our peers around the world, the, the major industrialized countries of the world. So that slide on the left shows that in the United States at the current time, we're spending approximately $8,000 per person on healthcare. Every man, woman, and child in this country, we're spending on average about $8,000. The rest of the world, the major industrialized countries, you can see they're all clustering around three or 4,000. I think it averages about 3,500. We're spending twice as much per person as our peers. So not only is it growing, but we just spend a lot to begin with. And again, that table on the right shows you, again, the trend in terms of percentage, healthcare percentage as a percentage of the gross domestic product. We're way above our peers. We spend too much, it's growing. Now, on the one hand, we spend a tremendous amount, but we also don't get sufficient quality for what we spend. So if we were spending this tremendous amount, and 
we were getting what we paid for, maybe we'd have an argument that we could sustain this. But in fact, not only do we spend way more than our peers around the world, but when you measure our quality of care with our peers, we don't do well. Okay, so we're paying a lot and we're not getting the quality. So here's one measure, obviously measuring quality in healthcare is very complex, but one measure is life expectancy. You can see uh, the United States life expectancy for both males and females is two years below the average of some of the other major countries um, in the industrialized world. Now, the biggest, the biggest weakness in terms of quality in our healthcare system which also drives up cost, is our failure to effectively manage patients who have one or more chronic diseases. Patients with chronic diseases, and this is a chart, these are asthma admission rates in the United States and around the world. The driver, one of the major drivers of healthcare costs is patients with chronic conditions. 80% of the total cost of healthcare is for patients with one or more chronic conditions. And I'm gonna talk briefly about three of them, asthma being one. You can see that for individuals who have asthma in the United States, they are three times as likely to be admitted to a hospital as in the rest of the world. Okay, so something's wrong, right? We're admitting patients with asthma at three times the rate of our peers. You'll see the same pattern with diabetes, another major chronic disease that drives healthcare costs in the United States, diabetes. We admit patients to a hospital with diabetes, acute complications of diabetes, at a rate that is three times higher than the rest of the world. And the same experience with heart failure, congestive heart failure. There, we do a little better. It's only two and a half times the rest of the world. So what, what, what is going on here? Why is this? And why is this a bad thing? Yes? That's a uh, yeah, possibility, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, lack of access, which again, the Healthcare Reform Act, one of its major focuses is access. Yeah. Say that again? Yes, yeah. I mean, I think there are many reasons. You, obviously, something as complex as this, you can't pin on one issue, but clearly, the lack of access to basic primary and preventive care is a critical determinant of the fact that people's condition deteriorates and they access the healthcare system at a point when they've really deteriorated and they have to be admitted, which is a real you know, major problem with our healthcare system. And again, that lack of access to primary care, to a personal doctor that many of our individuals have. And again, it's some, some of it is due to the lack of insurance, which again is the major focus of the Affordable Care Act. And some of it is even if you have insurance, it's hard to get a doctor's appointment. The whole reimbursement system to pay for care has been skewed away from primary care towards specialty care, towards acute care. So even if you have insurance, depending on your insurance plan, you could wait for an appointment for your doctor. So again, if patients, particularly patients with one or more chronic diseases don't have access to the doctor, can't get that regular primary and preventive care, Unfortunately, it leads to admission and readmission rates in this country for these basic chronic diseases that's triple the international averages and drives up costs. Because what is the most expensive thing we do in healthcare? Admit someone to a hospital, right? We admit someone to a hospital, on average it's $10,000. You go to your doctor, it's $200, which is cheaper. You know, and a couple of doctor visits could avoid that $10,000 admission. So the fact that we're skewed towards a highly specialized, highly technical, highly bed-oriented healthcare system results in this increase in, in admissions and, and increase in cost. Okay, so, so what is the solution to this in terms of what, what is the Healthcare Reform Act really seeking to do? And 
This is a slide from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the agency, the federal agency responsible for implementing the Health Care Reform Act. It is under the uh, Health and Human Services um, Department uh, in the federal government. So this is what health care reform and the Affordable Care Act is saying, what, this is what we have to do, okay? So what do we have to do? We have to do three things to address these challenges in our health care system. The first is better health care. Now, what they're talking about in terms of better health care is better care to individual patients, patient by patient, day by day, provide better quality care. And again, the federal government, when it defines quality health care, uses a definition that was developed by the Institute of Medicine, and there are six dimensions of what they call quality health care, and they're listed on that chart. Safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. And if I had a whole three hours, I could talk about each one of those. But again, better care to the individual patient. Obviously, we got to have better individual care to improve the system. Number two goal of health care reform is better health for the population. Okay, Be beyond better care to individuals, better population health by addressing underlying causes of poor uh, uh, community health, such as physical inactivity, behavioral risk factors, lack of preventive care, poor nutrition, et cetera. And then finally, lower the overall cost per person, the lower, lower the cost per capita by again, improving the care to individuals and improving the care to populations. So that is what, again, healthcare reform and CMS is telling us we need to do to address these challenges, both in terms of quality and cost. And again, we'll talk about the Healthcare Reform Act, the Affordable Care Act, but if you just remember those three things, that is what this act is designed to do. The Healthcare Reform Act itself is 2,700 pages long. It is impossible to read. And again, if we had an entire course or maybe even a whole degree in the Affordable Care Act, we wouldn't have enough time. A whole degree, <laughs> right. The first national degree program in the Affordable Care Act. So in a, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll touch on some highlights, but again, that previous slide, that's really what this is all about. Improving the care to individuals through those six domains of the Institute of Medicine, improving population health by better prevent, preventive and primary care, and finally, by doing those things, lowering the cost per capita of care. So the um, Affordable Care Act, uh, also known as Obamacare, its actual full name is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was approved by Congress and signed into law by the President in March of 2010. And then just this past June, June of 2012, it was upheld as constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Implementation actually began as soon as the President signed the, the bill. And implementation is a 10-year process, right? So it started like in January 11, and it goes for 10 years. And that's just the plan. Reality is often more complex than plans, but even the plan is a 10-year implementation. And again, there are three major goals. One is to expand insurance coverage and access to health care for uninsured and insured. See, many of us understand one of the goals being expand access to the uninsured, give insurance to those who don't have insurance, but a major goal is also to expand benefits and access for insured individuals. Because again, under the present system, even individuals with insurance have tremendous problems and challenges and difficulty accessing the system, and again, particularly accessing primary and preventive care. So the goal in terms of access is not only expand access to the uninsured, but it's also expand access to the insured. Okay, so that's the first goal is access. The second is, really, which it was driving the whole thing, is reduce health care costs. And the third is improved quality, which is again covered by those first two goals of the, that triple aim that I showed you from the CMS slide. There are, pro just in terms of that first bullet, in ensuring uh, coverage to the uninsured, roughly there are about 50 million Americans that don't have insurance. And the goal of this plan is to cover about 32 million. 
of those individuals who don't have insurance. And there's one big group who's left out of this whole program. Anybody know who? Undocumented, Undocumented right. So this, even if it worked perfectly, would never cover the undocumented. So that is a separate issue, a separate challenge, and hopefully maybe with immigration reform being discussed at a national level, that could be addressed on that route. But yes, yeah, so other than the undocumented, this um, program, if it works as designed, would cover about 90, 95% of everybody else and would ult ultimately end up in 16 million additional people having insurance. Okay, so again, I'll go through very briefly those three goals. So the first one is expand insurance coverage and access. How is that gonna be done? First, there's what's called in the, in the legislation an individual mandate. So that is that most citizens and legal residents are going to be required to purchase health insurance. Okay, so again, other than the undocumented, individuals will have to purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. There's also what they call an employer mandate. So for employers with 50 or more employees, they will have to provide insurance to their employees or pay a penalty, an assessment to the government. Large employers with 200 or more employees will have to offer an employer-sponsored health care plan directly to their employees. And then the small employers with fewer than 50 employees are exempt from any mandate. So their employees are sort of left on their own as individuals to purchase insurance through what I will talk about in a minute, the health exchanges. So individuals, if individuals are, are purchasing health insurance on their own or employers who are purchasing health insurance for their employees, they will be provided with subsidies, money, or tax credits based on income to purchase or provide that insurance. So that's all on those first one, two, three bullets are really the private insurance market. The expansion of insurance coverage also covers the governmental insurance market, Medicare and Medicaid. So you see that next bullet, um, Medicaid is going to be expanded to all individuals with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level. And Medicaid, although it's a federal state program, the, the guidelines, the eligibility guidelines are different state by state. So in New York State, we are very generous in terms of our Medicaid eligibility, so we will not have a lot of new Medicaid eligibles in New York State, but in some of the states of the country, this will be a major expansion of Medicaid eligibility, and again, the projections are around the country that this will provide insurance to ha half of that 32 million. 16 million people who will get health insurance under the Affordable Care Act will get it through this expansion of Medicaid. And then finally, there's also a little benefit expansion under the Medicare program, something called um, elimination of the donut hole in the Medicare prescription drug program. So I don't know, about a decade ago, so, uh, I think it was under the Bush administration, for the first time in the history of Medicare, they added a prescription drug benefit to Medicare. And when they did it, they created this bizarre formula called the donut hole, with, which is if you spend over, th any individual who's a Medicare beneficiary, if they spend over $3,000 per year, the next dollars, up to about 7,000, they pay out of pocket. So Medicare prescription drug program covers first 3,000, then you're in the quote donut hole, and then after 7,000, you're under catastrophic coverage. What this plan does in terms of Medicare, it will close that donut hole. So it will pay for most of the drug coverage under Medicare. Okay, so that, that's the general overview. Now for those individuals and employers who are going to be buying insurance for themselves or for their employees, the act requires the establishment in every state of what's called a health insurance exchange. And essentially, it's sort of like a virtual marketplace, a marketplace on a computer, um, through which individuals and small businesses can purchase health insurance. And um, if any individual state decides, you know what, we don't want to operate a health exchange in our state, then CMS, the federal government, will come in and create and operate a health exchange in that state. And all of these 50 health insurance exchanges around the country are required to offer a standard set of benefit packages with varying degrees of coverage and cost. So you have your best um, plan, which they call the platinum plan. And then you have your worse or lower cost plan, which they call, I think it's the bronze plan. 
And these, there's four or five different plans that all of these different health exchanges have to offer. And obviously, to get that best plan, that platinum plan, that's going to cover 90% of your costs, which is nice. The bronze plan will cover 60%, which is not as nice. But to get the better plan, you pay more upfront and premiums. So you will have your choices. These health insurance exchanges have to be in place as of January 2014. You can see in New York State, we have already established our New York State Health Insurance Exchange, and we, you can see that individuals with incomes up to 400% of the federal poverty level, which is about 46,000 for individuals, 94,000 for family four, will be eligible to receive tax credits to purchase insurance on the New York State Health Insurance Exchange. And essentially for individuals with incomes at or below 150% of federal poverty, they will not be paying any more than three or 4% of their income. So yes, they will be paying in, but it will be relatively limited amount. Okay, so that's the health insurance exchange. Now, again, this Affordable Care Act also impacts on those who currently have insurance, not only provides insurance for the uninsured. So there are changes in the private insurance um, sector as well and it improves insurance and healthcare access for all of us who have health insurance. Okay, and here's some examples. So first of all, under this law, 80 to 85% of the premium dollar that the government is paying under Medicare or Medicaid or the employer is paying under employer-based insurance, 80 to 85% of those premium dollars have to go to what? Health, care, that's a revelation, right? <laughs> you know, in the past, uh, whether it's a governmental insurance program or a private insurance program, they could keep 40 to 50% of that premium for profit, pay large salaries to the CEOs, right? Exactly, or stockholders. Under this law, regardless, whether it's a private, commercial insurance or government insurance, 80 to 85% of that premium has to go to direct health care. And what happens if it doesn't? The consumer gets a refund. You get a check in the mail. Oops, you know, your insurance company didn't spend 85% of your money on health care. You're going to get a refund. So that helps all of us. It extends coverage on the parent's plan for health insurance to children up to the age of 26. Um, there, it's no longer legal for health plans to place annual or lifetime limits on coverage. Very significant. Up until this act, healthcare plans could say, you know what, I'm establishing in a given year a dollar limit on how much healthcare you can use. And if you go over that annual limit, you're paying out of pocket. Or I could establish a lifetime limit. You can't spend more than 250000 over the course of your life on health care, and if you do, you're paying out of pocket. This all goes away. The plan also ex excludes it, or prohibits plans, health plans, from excluding individuals from coverage or enrollment into a plan due to a pre-existing condition. Also very important, the insurance companies will look at a patient and they'll say that patient you do a questionnaire, they'll give you a physical before they'll enroll you. And oops, you have again, you have a chronic disease, you have two chronic diseases. You're gonna be a very expensive customer. We're not gonna offer this plan to you. We're gonna exclude you from buying health insurance because you have some condition that ultimately will cost us money. And since this is a business, we're not gonna enroll you, we're not gonna offer you health insurance. Not legal anymore under the Affordable Care Act. And then finally, the, the law establishes annual deductible limits at $2,000 for individuals, $4,000 for families. So again, it's saying, you know, all of these different insurance plans do require individuals to, to pay a certain amount out of pocket before the benefit kicks in. That's the annual deductible. They're saying, fine, you can have annual deductibles, but it's limited, okay? So these are just some examples, but it's important to remember that this plan benefits all of us including those of us who have health insurance. Okay, so again, getting back to the beginning, we wanted to improve access. We want to also, what was one of the other goals is reduce costs, and there's a, a, a number of ways that this uh, act reduces cost. And again, 
basically, this entire program, the Affordable Care Act, by definition, from the beginning, in terms of discussions in the Congress and between the Congress and the President, was going to be budget neutral. So many of the things that I've talked about in terms of the insurance expansions, the health insurance exchanges, the um, providing access to insurance for 32 million people, that's going to cost additional federal dollars. So part of the deal is all of those additional federal dollars going in to expand health care access are going to be offset dollar for dollar, 100 percent, by other reductions in health care spending. So there is built into the act reductions in health care spending in other ways. Oops. Um, so again, ultimately at the end of the day, all of those increases are offset by either decreases in other areas of healthcare spending or some taxes. There are ac actually some taxes on other healthcare industries like pharmacy, and, uh, medical equipment manufacturers, et cetera. So between those taxes on, on sectors of the healthcare industry, as well as reductions in reimbursement in, in Medicare to providers for the most part, it becomes budget neutral to the federal budget. So these again are just some examples. And again, I really don't want to take too much of your time to go through. Again, these are just examples of reductions on the provider side. Um, let me just mention one or two of them. Um, so accountable care organizations. Anybody ever heard of accountable care organizations? Yeah, you know, so what is that? Okay. What in a we're talking here about the traditional fee for service Medicare program. And under the traditional fee for service Medicare program, Hospitals, doctors, medical providers get paid what we call fee-for-service. We get paid per episode of care. What the accountable care organization does is it establishes an ability of a system, a healthcare system, and we in New York City HHC are now an accountable care organization. We have applied for and we've received the status of being an accountable care organization. What it means is that for all of our traditional fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries, we will be taking f um, financial risk for that population. So again, let's, for example, say at Queens Hospital Center, I have 10,000 Medicare enrollees in the fee-for-service Medicare uh, system. Under the, as an accountable care organization, what I will do is, at the end of each year, they will look at how much I'm spending to take care of that population. If I can spend less than I spent the previous year, I will get half of those savings. So it's an attempt to try to incentivize me, Queens, HHC, other providers, to reduce costs of the traditional Medicare population by giving you skin in the game, by allowing you to share in any of those cost reductions, okay, on the one hand. On the other hand, it establishes 36 quality indicators. So they say, Okay, guys, reduce the cost of this Medicare population by better preventive care, primary care, et cetera. And if you reduce the cost for that, those 10,000 members over the course of the year, we're going to give you half of the savings. But to get all of that half, you have to achieve 36 quality measures because we don't want you achieving the cost savings at the cost of poor care, worse care. Okay, so that's what an accountable care organization is. It's trying to share some of the financial risk and quality risk under the traditional Medicare fee-for-service program with health systems, okay? So these are other examples, and I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but again, there's tremendous amount of just general re reductions in cost in this um, Affordable Care Act to offset the increased expenses. And then the final, uh, the final goal of the three goals, the, you know, the first was access, reduce cost, improve quality, here we are improve quality. What is this act doing directly to improve quality? And again, these are just some examples. There are many, many programs to improve quality in the Affordable Care Act. These are just some examples. For one, is that the act increases Medicaid rates for primary care to the Medicare level. And again, most of you 
would know what that means. But again, Medicaid for primary care is abysmal. Medicaid reimbursement for physicians is abysmal. Medicare is not so hot. Medicaid is 50% of Medicare. So if you're in practice in the community, you're a physician, uh, health center, whatever, many of them around the country will not even accept Medicaid patients. The reimbursement for Medicaid for physician services is so poor that many doctors just opt out of the Medicaid program. So if all the doctors are opting out of the Medicaid program, you have a lot of people in Medicaid, how do they have access? So again, this is a population, even with insurance, they can't access it because nobody takes Medicaid. So one of the very concrete steps that's included in this act is they're gonna essentially double the, Medica the, the rate, the physician rate, because Medicaid is about half of what Medicare pays physicians, so they're gonna pay physicians the Medicare rate. That's good, that should expand access. They're also going to expand what's called the federally qualified health centers. So these are community-based health centers around the country that receive reimbursement from the federal government based on their actual costs. They don't only have to rely on the income from third party and patients, they actually get cost-based reimbursement. There's one that just opened up right in our neighborhood, the Firehouse Health Center. That is a federally qualified health center that was opened up with capital dollars, construction dollars that came from the Affordable Care Act. And they will be able to continue to operate because they will get operating dollars through cost subsidies to keep running, whereas without those subsidies, they could not operate. So that's gonna happen around the country. So those are ways of expanding primary care access, paying the doctors better rates, and also expanding the number of federally qualified health centers. Another aspect is, the, the program eliminates cost sharing for preventive care, and one example is colorectal cancer screening, colonoscopies. So what the act says, you know what? You, you don't have to pay for that. No, no matter what your insurance is, whether it's Medicare or, Medicare or commercial, you don't have to pay a copay. So when you go in for a um, colonoscopy, it's bad enough. Do you wanna have to also pay a do you also want to pay a copay? Do you want to pay your annual deductible? So the act says that there are certain things that are really absolutely necessary, they're very important for health. Let's not, let's not make people pay for those. So that's a, another major quality improvement in the act. The act also establishes something called the value-based purchasing program. And again, Medicare and Medicaid were established roughly 50 years ago in the mid-1960s. And throughout the whole entire history of Medicare and Medicaid, reimbursement has been solely based on quantity. More admissions, more visits, more, 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 more money. Now, for the first time in the history of Medicare and Medicaid, under this value-based purchasing program, hospitals and doctors, health systems, will be paid not only based on quantity, but also quality. So there are specific quality indicators, and one example is fewer infections. Fewer patients acquire, acquiring infections in a hospital. Fewer surgical complications. Fewer bad things happening in the hospital, better quality, they're going to give you more money. And also now they survey every single one of our patients every day. And depending on the results of those surveys, if patients are more satisfied, we will get more money. So for the first time in the history of Medicare and Medicaid, our payments will be tied not only to quantity, more patients, but better quality, and better patient satisfaction. Um, so, and then just the final quality uh, uh, element that is part of this act is, is something called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, where again, this is sort of a think tank, a national think tank, which Medicare and the federal government will subsidize, which will gather best clinical practices across the country, and then once they've gathered those best clinical practices, share those best clinical practices, and try to assist providers around the country in practicing those best clinical practices. So again, this is, or this was, a very brief summary of a very big, complex act, um, and with that, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Yeah, 
Hello? What's working? Thank you for inviting all of us. Uh, I have a unique background. I'm a CPA and a lawyer and an insurance administrator. I'd love to hear your feedback on how you think it's going in New York. Because that information is general for the country. Health exchanges, they maybe have one carrier, Emblem, who might participate in the exchanges. The community rating law put in 20 years ago, plus the health Blue Cross did not go under when there was cherry picking. Still in place, feeding up groups of one and two to 50 to the benefit of 51 pluses. You mentioned the 80 to 85 percent, and I'm no fan of the insurance carriers. I have audit background as a healthcare specialist at Deloitte. I'll fight them all day long, but I know their purpose. What everyone forgets to mention is 80 to 85 percent, uh, they're paying out. You forgot the 10 percent reserves that they didn't calculate when they put that silly rule in place, and the carriers are paying out 94 to 98 percent. And the for-profit, if they're making it on the stock price, and I'm not a fan of them, bottom line is it's not something that's affecting all of us. There are lots of things that can go on for cost containment. Unfortunately, PPAC did very little for cost containment. New York's had community rating law and no pre-ex, you know, and you know, no age banning and all that since 1992. There's plenty there, of things that go on. Is there a question in there someplace? <laughs> State from what you know right now? Great, great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, as, as I said, this is a 10 year implementation. We haven't implemented the healthcare exchange even. The healthcare exchange in New York State starts this coming January. Uh, just a few comments about New York State. Um, one is that, again, half of the total expansion is, is viewed to be under Medicaid. That will not happen in New York State. We will not have this huge influx of uninsured into our Medicaid system. Um, but again, as to which insurance plans are going to ultimately decide by next year to join the health insurance exchange, I could not tell you. I have no idea. You may be able to tell me. I have no idea. Obviously, in theory, the more the better. Because this is, to some extent, about choice. And that's why it's a marketplace, why it's an exchange. They would like multiple insurers to get into that marketplace, offer multiple plans, so that individuals and employers have choices. So if ultimately it, it is only one insurance company that joins the New York State Health Insurance Chain, we have a problem. But I have no clue what's going to happen. I really don't. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Levy, you have a question? Just a quick and easy one. Um, if I'm denied coverage, who would I appeal to? Uh, the insurance carrier says, no, 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 I'm sorry, you've got a pre-existing condition. Um, I would say, since it's the New York, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that it probably would be the New York State Insurance Department, because that, that's who I think regulates the insurance industry, is the New York State Insurance. But again, in, the, in these types of situations, there's, there's some gray area, because the Department of Health also is going to regulate the whole healthcare exchange process, it's going to run it. So, but I, I think it would probably be the, the state insurance department. Uh, turn on the mic, yeah. Yeah. Where, where is it? Over there. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, let's ask the other side. And we're going to take three more, okay? So, uh, that's it. Yeah. All right. You may not like what I have to say. <laughs> no, it's, it's both. You had the opportunity to read the Wall Street Journal Monday. The cover article was on an impartial survey the Wall Street Journal conducted on 1,000 firms with 50 to 250 workers and those workers in those firms. Only 70% of all employers said they would keep their existing coverage once Obamacare was mandated. It gets worse. 4% they'd pay the penalty without even thinking about it. The problem is the penalties are not punitive enough. Then they interviewed the workers and said, only 56% would even opt in. So what you're really saying is 30% of all employers are gonna just can their plans and only half the people who are no longer covered will even opt in, which means now instead of having 60% covered, the net effect is 48%. Obamacare is doing the opposite of what we all hoped it was going to do. These are real facts. Okay, thank you. There's no question. No, there's no question. There's no question. No, no, no. Like any major change, I think the gentleman's point is exactly. There's going to be 
um, consequences that may not be positive, and I think that's clearly uh, an issue that's going to have to be worked out. Politically, this was a political negotiation. Politically, the penalties on the part of taxes on the part of businesses, employers, and individuals are very low. You know, and you're right. So some of them may say, you know what? The penalties, taxes are so low, I'm not going to play. So, so you're right. You're right. But this was a political negotiation, and then, like every other political negotiation, the result may not have been the perfect result. Now, my question is about the part-time employee. <laughs> The employee who doesn't work enough hours to be covered by the employer, but makes too much money to be covered by the state offering. How would Obamacare affect that? You know, I, I don't, I, I can't answer that specifically. And, you know, because it's not really, none of the thresholds in the Affordable Care Act in terms of the healthcare exchanges are based on whether you're full-time or part-time. It's all based on income levels. So, you know, whether you're eligible for certain programs through the health insurance exchange or whether you're eligible for governmental sponsored insurance such as Medicaid is all based on income. It's not based on whether you're full time or part time. So again, the New York State Health Insurance Exchange has been established. I think I don't know yet if it's you know, again, it starts officially in January. In the next several months it will be there and you will have as an you will have to go to that health insurance exchange and they will, there, be, there will be calculators on that health insurance exchange and you will plug in your personal information and it will give you various different options based on your personal information. But it's literally, it's going to be different to every individual, but it really wouldn't be affected by whether you're full-time or part-time. It's all based on income. Okay, hi. My question is a little bit different. I'm more, let's just bring it back a little bit to patient care. My thing is the elderly. When you look at the elderly in our society, they're on budgets. Most of the time they have Medicaid deductible, half of them cannot afford. So therefore they don't go to the doctors and stuff. How will Obamacare, with all of these new laws and having to get insurance, how will it help them? See that they will be on, on budgets already does it, is the window open for them to get better care and be able to help themselves? I, I would say in two ways it, would, it could potentially impact them in a positive way. One is this uh, pharmacy benefit change, so this donut hole thing. So if you have a, the Medicare prescription drug, there'll be less out-of-pocket costs is one. The other thing is that if you're a low-income elderly individual, you're eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, and this, this will expand Medicaid eligibility. Again not impacting so much in New York State, but around the country, if you look at the 50 states, there's gonna be a lot of individuals who do not have Medicaid, including elderly, who will have Medicaid and potentially Medicare, and then when you have both, they, Medicaid will help cover those gaps. So, you know, again, that and the pharmacy drug closing of the donut hole should help. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really wonderful and, and clear. Um, I have a question as a healthcare educator. Um, my question has to do with the fact that with all these changes occurring in healthcare, particularly in Queens and New York City area, we're finding that um, healthcare professionals have less and less time to help train students. And we're having a real decline in placements and a real struggle getting mentors and a real difficulty you know, in quality of care training for the healthcare professionals um, that we're working to serve this community in Queens. And could you address how we can change that, which will contribute to increased quality? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, there is in the act, and I don't, again, know all the specifics, but there is workforce development training components of the act. And again, I can't speak specifically to them. Um, but again, really the, the, the downside of all of this is this cost containment is really gonna put pressure on what we need to do with respect to the, to the training and to the clinical practice. Because again, 
year after year after year, they continue to re reduce reimbursement for healthcare providers and physicians and systems. We have those limited resources. Unfortunately, one of the places that where the dollars get taken away is in the mentorship, the training. And that's, a, that's really a reality. And I don't see any silver bullet in this program. Although, there, again, there are specific sub-programs to enhance workforce development. But again, as the system overall continues to face financial pressure and reductions in reimbursement, we are going to be more and more challenged to use whatever limited resources we have on direct patient care. It's a challenge every day that we have to sort of make decisions. And one example is graduate medical education, is the training of residents. This act takes a huge amount of dollars from the graduate medical education system. I mean, one of the biggest Medicare cuts to support expanded insurance access in this entire proposal is taking dollars away from the system that funds hospitals for being teaching hospitals and using our physicians, our attending physicians, as mentors and supervisors of, of residents. So you're right, this, this does not solve that problem. On the other hand, you know, the fact that the, the, the whole thing is based on expanding primary care access, I think ultimately there has to be some sort of, um, you know, recognition that again, if, if the system to train the, those those individuals who can perform primary care, you know, be, be it again physicians, uh, PAs, NPs, if, if those if that system doesn't work, this whole thing is going to collapse. But I don't think there's a, unfortunately, uh, an answer in this act to that challenge. 